The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. Out of these impediments to unity rose the Italian city-state. Men thought in terms of their city, and only a few philosophers like Machiavelli or a poet like Petrarch could think of Italy as a whole. Even in the 16th century, Cellini would refer to Florentines as men of our nation and to Florence as my fatherland. Petrarch, freed by foreign residents from a merely local patriotism, mourned the petty wars and divisions of his native country, and in an eloquent mode, Italia mia, besought the princes of Italy to give her unity and peace. O oh, my own Italy, though words are vain, the mortal wounds to close innumerable that thy bosom stain, yet may it soothe my pain to sing of Tiber's woes and Arno's wrongs, as on Poe's saddened shore mournful I wander and my numbers poor. Oh, is this not the soil my foot first pressed? And here, in cradled dressed, was I not softly hushed and fondly reared? Oh, is this not my country, so endeared by every filial tie, in whose earth shrouded both my parents lie? Oh, by this tender thought your hard hearts to some pity wrought. Look on the people's grief, who under God of you expect relief, and if ye but relent, virtue shall rouse her in embattled might against blind fury bent, nor long shall doubtful hang the unequal fight. No, no, the ancient flame is not extinguished yet that raised the Italian name. Petrarch had dreamed that Rienzo might make Italy one. When that bubble burst, he turned like Dante to the head of the Holy Roman Empire, theoretically the secular heir to all the temporal powers of the pagan Roman Empire in the West. Soon after Rienzo's retirement in 1347, Petrarch addressed a stirring message to Charles IV, King of Bohemia, and as King of the Romans, heir apparent to the imperial throne. Let the king come down to Rome and be crowned emperor, the poet pleaded. Let him make Rome, not Prague, his capital. Let him restore unity, order, and peace to the garden of the empire, Italy. When Charles crossed the Alps in 1354, he invited Petrarch to meet him at Mantua and listened courteously to appeals echoing the impassioned pleas of Dante to Charles's grandfather, Henry VII. But Charles, having no force adequate to conquer all the despots of Lombardy and all the citizens of Florence and Venice, hurried to Rome, got himself crowned by a papal prefect for lack of a pope, and then hastened back to Bohemia, sedulously selling imperial vicariates on the way. Two years later, Petrarch went to him in Prague as Milanese ambassador, but with no significant results for Italy. Perhaps there would have been no Renaissance if Petrarch had had his way. The fragmentation of Italy favored the Renaissance. Large states promote order and power rather than liberty or art. The commercial rivalry of the Italian cities inaugurated and completed the work of the Crusades in developing the economy and wealth of Italy. The variety of political centers multiplied interurban strife, but these modest conflicts never totaled the death and destruction caused in France by the Hundred Years' War. Local independence weakened the capacity of Italy to defend herself against foreign invasion, but it generated a noble rivalry of the cities and princes in cultural patronage, in the zeal to excel in architecture, sculpture, painting, education, scholarship, poetry. Renaissance Italy, like Goethe's Germany, had many Parises. We need not exaggerate to appreciate the degree in which Petrarch and Boccaccio prepared the Renaissance. Both were still mortgaged to medieval ideas. The great storyteller in his lusty youth laughed at clerical immorality and relic-mongering, but so had millions of medieval men and women and he became more orthodox and medieval in those very years in which he studied Greek. Petrarch properly and prophetically described himself as standing between two eras. He accepted the dogmas of the church even while he flayed the morals of Avignon. He loved the classics with a troubled conscience at the close of the Age of Faith, as Jerome had loved them at its opening. He wrote excellent medieval essays on contempt of the secular world and on the holy peace of the religious life. Nevertheless, he was more faithful to the classics than to Laura. He sought and cherished ancient manuscripts and inspired others to do the same. He overleaped nearly all medieval authors except Augustine to regain continuity with Latin literature. He formed his manner and style on Virgil and Cicero, and he thought more of the fame of his name than of the immortality of his soul. His poems fostered a century of artificial sonneteering in Italy, but they helped to mold the sonnets of Shakespeare. His eager spirit passed down to Pico, 
his polished form to Politian. His letters and essays through a bridge of classical urbanity and grace between Seneca and Montaigne. His reconciliation of antiquity and Christianity matured in Popes Nicholas V and Leo X. He was truly in these ways the father of the Renaissance. But again it would be an error to overrate the contributions of antiquity to this Italian apogee. It was a fulfillment rather than a revolution, and the medieval maturation played a far greater role than the recovery of classic manuscripts and art. Many medieval scholars had known and loved the pagan classics. It was the monks who had preserved them. It was clerics who in the 12th and 13th centuries had translated or edited them. The great universities had since 1100 passed down to the youth of Europe some measure of the mental and moral heritage of the race. The growth of a critical philosophy in Origina and Abelard, the introduction of Aristotle and Averroes into university curriculums, the brave proposal of Aquinas to prove nearly all Christian dogmas by reason, so soon followed by Duns Scotus's confession that most of these doctrines were beyond reason, had reared and shattered the intellectual edifice of scholasticism and had left the educated Christian free to attempt a new synthesis of pagan philosophy and medieval theology with the experience of life. The liberation of the towns from feudal hindrances, the widening of commerce, the spread of a money economy, all these had preceded Petrarch's birth. Roger of Sicily and Frederick II, not to speak of Moslem caliphs and sultans, had taught rulers to give glamour to power by patronizing art and poetry, science and philosophy. Medieval men and women, despite another worldly minority, had kept unabashed the natural human relish for the simple and sensual pleasures of life. The men who conceived, built, and carved the cathedrals had their own sense of beauty, and a sublimity of thought and form never surpassed. Therefore, all the bases of the Renaissance had been established by the time of Petrarch's death. The amazing growth and zest of Italian trade and industry had gathered the wealth that financed the movement, and the passage from rural peace and stagnation to urban vitality and stimulus had begotten the mood that nourished it. The political basis had been prepared in the freedom and rivalry of the cities, in the overthrow of an idle aristocracy, in the rise of educated princes and of virile bourgeoisie. The literary basis had been prepared in the improvement of the vernacular languages and in the zeal for recovering and studying the classics of Greece and Rome. The ethical basis had been laid, increasing wealth was breaking down old moral restraints, contact with Islam and commerce and crusades had encouraged a new tolerance for doctrinal and moral deviations from traditional beliefs and ways. The rediscovery of a pagan world relatively free in thought and conduct shared in undermining medieval dogmas and morality. Interest in a future life gave ground before secular, human, earthly concerns. Aesthetic development proceeded. The medieval hymns, the cycles of romance, the songs of the troubadours, the sonnets of Dante and his Italian predecessors, the sculptured harmony and form of the divine comedy, had left a heritage of literary art. The classic models transmitted a refinement of taste and thought, a polish and politeness of speech and style to Petrarch, who would bequeath it to an international dynasty of urbane genius from Erasmus to Anatole France. And a revolution in art had begun when Giotto abandoned the mystic rigor of Byzantine mosaics to study men and women in the actual flow and natural grace of their lives. In Italy, all roads were leading to the Renaissance. Chapter 2. The Popes in Avignon. 1309 to 1377. 1. The Babylonian Captivity. In 1309, Pope Clement V removed the papacy from Rome to Avignon. He was a Frenchman, the former Bishop of Bordeaux. He owed his elevation to Philip IV of France, who had startled all Christendom by not only defeating Pope Boniface VIII, but arresting him, humiliating him, and almost starving him to death. Clement's life would be unsafe in a Rome that reserved to itself the right to maltreat a pope and resented the insolent irreverence of the king. Moreover, the French cardinals formed now a large majority in the sacred college and refused to entrust themselves to Italy. So Clement stayed a while at Lyon and Poitiers. Then, hoping to be less subject to Philip in a territory owned by the king of Naples as Count of Provence, he took up his residence in Avignon, just across the Rhone from 14th century France. The immense effort of the papacy from Gregory VII, 1073 to 1085, to Boniface VIII, 1294 to 1303, to form a European world state by subordinating the kings to the popes, had failed. 
nationalism had triumphed over a theocratic federalism. Even in Italy, the republics of Florence and Venice, the city-states of Lombardy, and the kingdom of Naples rejected ecclesiastical control. A republic twice raised its head in Rome, and in the other papal states, military adventurers or feudal magnates, Baglioni, Bentivogli, Malatestas, Manfredi, Sforzas, were replacing the vicars of the church with their own swashbuckling authority. The papacy in Rome had wielded the prestige of centuries, and the nations had learned to do it homage and sent it fees. But a papacy of continuously French pontiffs, from 1305 to 1378, almost imprisoned by the kings of France, and lending them great sums to carry on their wars, seemed to Germany, Bohemia, Italy, and England a hostile power, the psychological weapon of the French monarchy. Increasingly, those nations ignored its excommunications and interdicts, and only with rising reluctance yielded it a declining reverence. Against these difficulties, Clement V labored with patience, if not with fortitude. He bowed as little as he could to Philip IV, who held over Clement's head the threat of a scandalous post-mortem inquest into the private conduct and beliefs of Boniface VIII. Harassed for funds, the Pope sold ecclesiastical benefices to the highest bidder, but he lent tacit approval to the merciless reports that the mayor of Angers and the bishop of Mond presented on the subject of clerical morals and church reform to the Council of Vienne in 1311. He himself led a clean and frugal life and practiced an undemonstrative piety. He protected the great physician and critic of the church, Arnold of Villanova, from persecution for heresy. He reorganized medical studies at Montpellier on Greek and Arabic texts, and tried, though he failed, to establish chairs of Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic in the universities. To all his troubles was added a painful disease, lupulus, probably a fistula, which compelled him to shun society and killed him in 1314. In a better environment he would have been an ornament to the church. The chaotic interregnum that followed revealed the temper of the times. Dante wrote to the Italian cardinals, urging them to hold out for an Italian pope and to return to Rome but only six of the twenty-three cardinals were Italian, and when the conclave met in a locked room at Carpentras, near Avignon, it was surrounded by a Gascon populace that shouted, Death to the Italian cardinals! The houses of these prelates were attacked and destroyed. The crowd set fire to the building that housed the conclave. The cardinals broke a passage through the rear wall and fled from the fire and the mob. For two years no further attempt was made to choose a pope. Finally at Lyon, under the protection of French soldiery, the cardinals raised to the papacy a man already seventy-two years of age, who might reasonably be expected to die soon, but who was destined to rule the church for eighteen years with rugged zeal, insatiable avidity, and imperial will. John the Twelfth had been born at Cahors in southern France, the son of a cobbler. It was the second time that a cobbler's son had risen, by the remarkable democracy of an authoritarian church, to the highest place in Christendom. Urban IV, from 1261 to 1264, had shown the way. Employed as a teacher for the children of the French king of Naples, John studied civil and canon law with such aptitude that the king took him into favor. On the king's recommendation, Boniface VIII made him bishop of Fréjoux, and Clement V raised him to the see of Avignon. At Carpentras, the gold of Robert of Naples silenced the patriotism of the Italian cardinals and the cobbler's son became one of the strongest of the popes. He displayed abilities rarely combined, scholarly studies and administrative skill. Under his leadership, the Avignon papacy developed a competent, if corrupt, bureaucratic organization and a fiscal staff that shocked the envious chancelleries of Europe with its capacity for gathering revenues. John undertook a dozen major conflicts that called for funds. Like his predecessor, he sold benefices, but without a blush. By sundry devices, this scion of the banking town of Cahors so fattened the papal treasury that at his death it held 18 million gold florins, or 450 million dollars, and 7 million in plate and jewelry. He explained that the papal curia had lost much of its income from Italy and had to build its offices, staff, and services anew. John seems to have felt that he could serve God best by winning mammon to his side. His personal habits tended to an abstemious simplicity. Meanwhile, he patronized learning, shared in establishing medical schools at Perugia and Cahors, helped universities, founded a Latin college in Armenia, fostered the study of Oriental languages, fought alchemy and magic, 
spent days and nights in scholastic studies, and ended as a theologian suspected of heresy. Perhaps to check the spread of a mysticism that claimed direct contact with God, John ventured to teach that no one, not even the mother of God, can attain to the beatific vision until the last judgment. A storm of protest arose among the eschatological experts. The University of Paris denounced the Pope's view, a church synod at Vincennes condemned it as heresy, and Philip VI of France ordered him to reform his theology. The crafty nonagenarian eluded them all by dying in 1334. John's successor was a man of gentler mold. Benedict XII, the son of a baker, tried to be a Christian as well as a pope. He resisted the temptation to distribute offices among his relatives. He earned an honorable hostility by bestowing benefices for merits, not for fees. He repressed bribery and corruption in all branches of church administration. He alienated the mendicant orders by commanding them to reform. He was never known to be cruel or to shed blood in war. All the forces of corruption rejoiced at his early death in 1342. Clement VI, born of a noble house in Limousin, was accustomed to luxury, gaiety, and art, and could not understand why a pope should be austere when the papal treasury was full. Almost all who came to him for appointments secured them. No one, he said, should depart from him unsatisfied. He announced that any poor clergyman who should come to him within the next two months would partake of his bounty. An eyewitness reckoned that one hundred thousand came. He gave rich gifts to artists and poets, maintained a stud of horses equal to any in Christendom, admitted women freely to his court, enjoyed their charms, and mingled with them in Gallic gallantry. The Countess of Touraine was so close to him that she sold ecclesiastical preferments with careless publicity. Hearing of Clement's good nature, the Romans sent an embassy inviting him to reside in Rome. He did not relish the prospect, but he appeased them by declaring that the jubilee, which Boniface VIII had established in 1300 for every hundred years, should be celebrated every half-century. Rome rejoiced at the news, deposed Rienzo, and renewed its political submission to the popes. Under Clement VI, Avignon became the capital not only of the religion, but of the politics, culture, pleasure, and corruption of the Latin world. Now the administrative machinery of the church took its definitive form. An apostolic chamber, Camera Apostolica, in charge of finances, and headed by a papal chamberlain, Camerarius, who was second in dignity to the Pope alone, a papal chancery, or cancellaria, whose seven agencies, directed by a cardinal vice-chancellor, handled the complex correspondence of the see, a papal judiciary composed of prelates and laymen learned in canon law, and including the consistory, the Pope and his cardinals acting as a court of appeals, and an apostolic penitentiary, a college of clergy who dealt with marital dispensations, excommunication and interdict, and heard the confessions of those seeking papal absolution. To house the Pope and his aides, these ministries and agencies, their staffs and servants, Benedict XII began, and Urban V completed, the immense palace of the popes, a congeries of Gothic buildings, living chambers, council halls, chapels, and offices, enclosing two courts, and themselves enclosed by mighty ramparts whose height and breadth and massive towers suggest that the popes, if besieged, would rely on no miracle for their defense. Benedict XII invited Giotto to come and decorate the palace and the adjoining cathedral. Giotto planned to come, but died and in 1338 Benedict summoned from Siena Simone Martini, whose frescoes, now obliterated, marked the zenith of painting in Avignon. Around this palace, in lesser palaces, mansions, tenements, and hovels, gathered a great population of prelates, envoys, lawyers, merchants, artists, poets, servants, soldiers, beggars, and prostitutes of every grade from cultured courtesans to tavern tarts. Here, for the most part, dwelt those bishops in partibus infidelium, who were appointed to seize that had fallen into the hands of non-Christians. We, who are inured to colossal figures, can imagine the amount of money required to support this complex administrative establishment and its entourage. Several sources of income were nearly dried up. Italy, deserted by the papacy, sent hardly anything. Germany, at odds with John XII, sent half its usual tribute. France, holding the church almost at its mercy, appropriated for secular purposes a large part of French ecclesiastical revenues, 
and borrowed heavily from the papacy to finance the Hundred Years' War. England severely restricted the flow of money to a church that was in effect an ally of France. To meet this situation, the Avignon popes were driven to develop every trickle of revenue. Each bishop or abbot, whether appointed by pope or secular prince, transmitted to the curia, as an inaugural fee, one-third of his prospective income for a year, and paid exasperating gratuities to the numerous intermediaries who had supported his nomination. If he became an archbishop, he had to pay a substantial fee for the archiepiscopal pallium, a circular band of white wool worn over the chasuble as the insignia of his office. When a new pontiff was elected, every ecclesiastical benefice or office sent him its full revenue for one year, annats, and thereafter a tenth of its revenue in each year. Additional voluntary contributions were expected from time to time. On the death of any cardinal, archbishop, bishop, or abbot, his personal possessions and effects belonged to the papacy. In the interim between such death and the installation of a new appointee, the popes received the revenues and paid the expenses of the benefice, and they were accused of deliberately extending this interval. Every ecclesiastical appointee was held responsible for dues unpaid by his predecessors. As bishops and abbots were in many cases feudal proprietors of estates received in fief from the king, they had to pay him tribute and provide him with soldiery, so that many were hard-pressed to meet their combined ecclesiastical and secular obligations. And as the papal exactions were more severe than the states, we find the hierarchy sometimes supporting the king against the pope. The Avignon pontiffs almost completely ignored the ancient rites of cathedral chapters or monastic councils to choose bishops or abbots and these bypassed collators joined in the accumulating resentment. Cases tried in the papal judiciary usually required the expensive help of lawyers, who had to pay an annual fee for license to plead in the papal courts. Every judgment or favor received from the curia expected a gift in acknowledgment. Even permission to be ordained had to be bought. The secular governments of Europe looked with awe and fury upon the fiscal machinery of the popes. Protests arose from every quarter, and not least vigorously from churchmen themselves. The Spanish prelate Alvaro Palayo, though thoroughly loyal to the papacy, wrote, On the Lamentation of the Church, in which he mourned that, Whenever I entered the chambers of the ecclesiastics of the papal court, I found brokers and clergy engaged in weighing and reckoning the money that lay in heaps before them. Wolves are in control of the church and feed on the blood of the Christian flock. Cardinal Napoleone Orsini was disturbed to find that nearly all the bishoprics of Italy were the object of barter or family intrigue under Clement V. Edward III of England, himself adept in taxation, reminded Clement VI that the successor of the apostles was commissioned to lead the Lord's sheep to the pasture, not to fleece them. And the English Parliament passed several statutes to check the taxing power of the popes in Britain. In Germany, papal collectors were hunted down, imprisoned, mutilated, in some cases strangled. In 1372, the clergy of Cologne, Bonn, Xanten, and Mainz bound themselves by oath not to pay the tithes demanded by Gregory XI. In France, many benefices were ruined by a tragic combination of war, the Black Death, pillage by brigands, and the exactions of papal collectors. Many pastors abandoned their parishes. To such complaints the popes replied that ecclesiastical administration required all these funds, that incorruptible agents were hard to find, and that they themselves were in a sea of troubles. Probably under duress, Clement VI lent Philip VI of France 592,000 gold florins, or $14,800,000, and 3,517,000 more, or $87,925,000, to King John II. Great outlays were required to reconquer the lost papal states in Italy. Despite all taxes, the popes suffered dire deficits. John XXII rescued the papal treasury by paying into it 440,000 florins from his personal funds. Innocent VI sold his silver plate, his jewelry, and works of art. Urban V had to borrow 30,000 florins from his cardinals. Gregory XI owed 120,000 francs when he died. Critics retorted that deficits were caused not by legitimate outlays, but by the worldly luxury of the papal court and its hangers-on. Clement VI was surrounded by male and female relatives, attired in precious stuffs and furs, by knights, squires, sergeants-at-arms, 
chaplains, ushers, chamberlains, musicians, poets, artists, doctors, scientists, tailors, philosophers, and chefs who were the envy of kings. All in all, some four hundred persons, all fed, clothed, lodged, and salaried by a lovably lavish pope who had never known the cost of money. Clement thought of himself as a ruler who had to awe his subjects and impress ambassadors by conspicuous consumption after the custom of kings. The cardinals, too, as the royal council of estate, as well as the princes of the church, had to maintain establishments befitting their dignity and power. Their retinues, equipages, banquets were the talk of the town. Perhaps Cardinal Bernard of Garve overdid it, who hired fifty-one dwellings to house his retainers, and Cardinal Peter of Banach, five of whose ten stables sheltered thirty-nine horses in comfort and style. Even bishops fell in line, and despite remonstrances from provincial synods, kept rich establishments with jesters, falcons, and dogs. Avignon now assumed the morals as well as the manners of royal courts. Venality there was notorious. Guillaume Durand, Bishop of Mende, reported to the Council of Vienne, The whole church might be reformed if the Church of Rome would begin by removing evil examples from itself, by which men are scandalized and the whole people, as it were, infected. For in all lands the Holy Church of God, and especially the Most Holy Church of Rome, is in evil repute, and all cry and publish it abroad that within her bosom all men, from the greatest unto even the least, have set their hearts upon covetousness. That the whole Christian folk take from the clergy pernicious examples of gluttony is clear and notorious, since the said clergy feast more luxuriously and splendidly, and with more dishes, than princes and kings. And Petrarch, a master of words, exhausted his vocabulary of vituperation to brand Avignon as the impious Babylon, the hell on earth, the sink of vice, the sewer of the world. There is in it neither faith nor charity nor religion nor the fear of God. All the filth and wickedness of the world have run together here. Old men plunge hot and headlong into the arms of Venus. Forgetting their age, dignity, and powers, they rush into every shame, as if all their glory consisted not in the cross of Christ, but in feasting, drunkenness, and unchastity. Fornication, incest, rape, adultery are the lascivious delights of the pontifical games. Such testimony from an eyewitness who never veered from orthodoxy cannot be entirely disregarded, but it has the ring of exaggeration and personal resentment. Some discount must be made from it as the cry of a man who hated Avignon for snatching the papacy from Italy who begged for benefices from the Avignon popes, received many and asked for more, who consented to live with the murderous and anti-papal Visconti, and had two bastards of his own. Morals in Rome, to which Petrarch importuned the popes to return, were then no better than in Avignon, except as poverty is an aid to chastity. St. Catherine of Siena was not as vivid as the poet in describing Avignon, but she told Gregory the Eleventh that at the papal court her nostrils were assailed by the odors of hell. Amid the moral decay there were many prelates who were worthy of their calling and preferred the morals of Christ to those of their time. When we reflect that of the seven Avignon popes, only one lived a life of worldly pleasure, and another, John the Twenty-Second, however rapacious and severe, disciplined himself to ascetic austerity, and another, Gregory the Eleventh, though merciless in war, was in peace a man of exemplary morals and piety, and three, Benedict the Twelfth, Innocent the Sixth, and Urban the Fifth, were men of almost saintly life. We cannot hold the popes responsible for all the vice that gathered in papal Avignon. The cause was wealth, which has had like results in other times, in the Rome of Nero, the Rome of Leo X, the Paris of Louis XIV, the New York and Chicago of today. And as in these last cities we perceive that the vast majority of men and women lead decent lives or practice their vices modestly, so we may presume that even in Avignon the lecher and the courtesan, the glutton and the thief, the crooked lawyer and the dishonest judge, the worldly cardinal and the faithless priest were exceptions standing out more vividly than elsewhere because surveyed, and sometimes condoned, by the apostolic see. The scandal was real enough to share with the flight from Rome in undermining the prestige and authority of the Church. As if to confirm the suspicion that they were no longer a world power but merely the tools of France, the Avignon popes named 113 Frenchmen to the College of Cardinals in a total of 134 nominations. 
Hence the connivance of the English government at Wycliffe's uncompromising attacks upon the papacy. The German electors repudiated any further interference of the popes in the election of their kings and emperors. In 1372, the abbots of the Archdiocese of Cologne, in refusing the tithe to Pope Gregory XI, publicly proclaimed that the apostolic see has fallen into such contempt that the Catholic faith in these parts seems to be seriously imperiled. The laity speaks slightingly of the church because, departing from the custom of former days, she hardly ever sends forth preachers or reformers, but rather ostentatious men, cunning, selfish, and greedy. Things have come to such a pass that few are Christians in more than name. It was the Babylonian captivity of the popes in Avignon and the ensuing papal schism that prepared the Reformation, and it was their return to Italy that restored their prestige and deferred catastrophe for a century. 2. The Road to Rome The status of the church was lowest in Italy. In 1342, Benedict XII, to weaken the rebellious Louis of Bavaria, confirmed to all the despots of the Lombard cities the authority they had assumed in defiance of imperial claims. Louis, in revenge, gave the imperial sanction to the despots who had seized the papal states. Milan openly flouted the popes. When Urban V sent two legates to Milan in 1362, bearing bulls of excommunication to the Visconti, Bernabo compelled them to eat the bulls, parchment, silken cords, and leaden seals. Sicily, ever since its Vespers in 1282, had remained in open enmity to the popes. Clement VI engaged an army to recapture the papal states, but it was his successor, Innocent VI, who for a time restored them to obedience. Innocent was almost a model pope. After indulging a few relatives with appointments, he determined to stop the current of nepotism and corruption. He put an end to the epicurean splendor and wasteful outlay of the papal court, dismissed the horde of servants that had ministered to Clement VI, scattered the swarm of place-seekers, ordered every priest to reside in his benefice, and himself led a life of integrity and modesty. He saw that the authority of the church could be restored only by liberating her from the power of France and returning the papacy to Italy. But a church alienated from France could hardly maintain herself without the revenues that had formerly come to her from the papal states. Innocent, a man of peace, decided that these could be reclaimed only by war. He entrusted the task to a man with the fervent faith of a Spaniard, the energy of a Dominic, and the chivalry of a Castilian grandee. Gilles Avarez Carrillo de Albornoz had been a soldier under Alfonso XI of Castile, and had not abandoned war on becoming Archbishop of Toledo. Now, as Cardinal Egidio d'Albornoz, he became a brilliant general. He persuaded the Republic of Florence, which feared the despots and brigands that surrounded her, to advance him the funds to organize an army. By clever and yet honorable negotiation, rather than by force, he deposed one after another of the petty tyrants that had seized the papal states. He gave to these states the Egidian constitutions of 1357 that remained their basic law till the 19th century and that provided a workable compromise between self-government and allegiance to the papacy. He outwitted the famous English adventurer John Hawkwood, took him prisoner, and threw the fear, if not of God, at least of the papal legate into the condottieri. He recovered Bologna from a rebellious archbishop and persuaded the Visconti of Milan to make their peace with the church. The way was now open for the popes to return to Italy. Urban V continued the austerity and reforms of Innocent VI. He labored to restore discipline and honesty in the clergy and at the papal court, discountenanced luxury among the cardinals, checked the chicanery of the lawyers and the extortions of the moneylenders, punished simony, and won to his service men of excellence in character and mind. He maintained at his own expense a thousand students in the universities, founded a new college at Montpellier, and supported many savants. To crown his pontificate, he resolved to restore the papacy to Rome. The cardinals were horrified at the prospect. Most of them had their roots and affections in France and were hated in Italy. They begged him not to heed the pleas of St. Catherine or the eloquence of Petrarch. Urban pointed out to them the chaotic condition of France, its king a prisoner in England, its armies shattered, the English conquering the southern provinces and coming ever nearer to Avignon. What would a victorious England do to a papacy that had served and financed France? So on April 30th, 1367, he sailed from Marseille, joyously escorted by Italian galleys. 
On October 16th, he entered Rome amid the wild acclaim of the populace, the clergy, and the aristocracy. Italian princes held the bridle of the white mule on which he rode, and Petrarch poured out his gratitude to the French pope who dared to live in Italy. It was a desolate though happy Rome, impoverished by its long separation from the papacy, half of its churches deserted and decayed, St. Paul's in ruins, St. Peter's threatening at any minute to collapse, the Lateran Palace but recently destroyed by fire, palaces rivaling the tenements in dilapidation, swamps where there had been buildings, rubbish lying ungathered in the squares and streets. Urban gave orders and allotted funds for rebuilding the papal palace. Unable to bear the sight of Rome, he went to live at Monte Fiascone. But even there his memories of luxurious Avignon and beloved France made him miserable. Petrarch heard of his hesitations and urged him to persevere. St. Bridget of Sweden predicted that he would die soon if he left Italy. The emperor, Charles IV, sought to strengthen him, gave the imperial sanction to the papal recovery of central Italy, came humbly to Rome in 1368 to lead the pope's horse from Sant'Angelo to St. Peter's, served him at Mass, and was crowned by him in a ceremony that seemed happily to heal the old strife of empire and papacy. Then, on September 5, 1370, perhaps yielding to his French cardinals and saying that he wished to make peace between England and France, Urban embarked for Marseille. On September 27th he reached Avignon, and there, on December 19th, he died, clothed in the habit of a Benedictine monk, lying on a miserable couch, and having ordered that all who cared to enter should be admitted, so that all might see how vain and brief is the splendor of the most exalted man. Gregory XI had been made a cardinal at eighteen by his genial uncle, Clement VI. On December 29, 1370, he was ordained a priest, and on December 30th, aged thirty-nine, he was elected pope. He was a man of learning, in love with Cicero. Fate made him a man of war and consumed his pontificate in violent revolt. Urban V, fearing that a French pope could not yet trust Italians, had named too many Frenchmen as legates to govern the papal states. Finding themselves in a hostile environment, these prelates had built fortresses against the people, had imported numerous French aids, had taxed exorbitantly, and had preferred tyranny to tact. At Perugia, a nephew of the legate pursued a married lady so voraciously that in trying to escape him she fell from a window and was killed. When a deputation demanded punishment for the nephew, the legate replied, Why all this fuss? Do you mistake a Frenchman for a eunuch? By a variety of means the legates earned such hatred that in 1375 many of the states rose against them in successive revolutions. St. Catherine made herself the voice of Italy and urged Gregory to remove these evil pastors who poison and devastate the garden of the church. Florence, usually an ally of the papacy, took the lead of the movement and unfurled a red flag bearing in golden letters the word Libertas. At the beginning of 1375, sixty-four cities had acknowledged the Pope as their civic as well as their spiritual head. In 1376, only one remained loyal to him. It seemed that all the work of Albornoz was undone, and that central Italy was again lost to the papacy. Gregory, prodded by the French cardinals, charged the Florentines with being the head of the revolt, and ordered them to submit to the papal legates. When they refused, he excommunicated them, forbade religious services in their city, and declared all Florentines to be outlaws, whose goods might be seized, and whose persons might be enslaved by any man anywhere. The whole structure of Florentine commerce and finance was threatened with collapse. England and France at once laid hands upon the Florentines and their property there. Florence responded by confiscating all church property in its territory, tearing down the buildings of the Inquisition, closing the ecclesiastical courts, jailing, in some cases hanging, obstinate priests, and sending an appeal to the people of Rome to join the revolution and end all temporal power of the church in Italy. While Rome hesitated, Gregory dispatched to its leaders a solemn promise that if the city remained loyal to him, he would return the papacy to Rome. The Romans accepted the pledge and kept the peace. Meanwhile, the Pope had sent to Italy a force of wild Breton mercenaries under the command of the fierce Cardinal Legate Robert of Geneva. Robert waged the war with incredible barbarity. Having taken Cesena with the promise of an amnesty, he put every man, woman, and child there to the sword. John Hawkwood, leading his mercenaries in the service of the church, slew four thousand in Faenza, on suspicion that the town intended to join the revolt. 
St. Catherine of Siena was shocked by these brutalities, by the mutual confiscations, by the cessation of religious services in so much of Italy. She wrote to Gregory, You are indeed bound to win back the territory which has been lost to the church, but you are even more bound to win back all the lambs which are the church's real treasure and whose loss will truly impoverish her. You must strike men with the weapons of goodness, love, and peace, and you will gain more than by the weapons of war. When I inquire of God what is best for your salvation, for the restoration of the church and for the whole world, there is no other answer but the word peace, peace, for the love of the crucified Savior, peace. Florence invited her to be one of its envoys to Gregory. She went and took the occasion to condemn the morals of Avignon. She was so outspoken that many called for her arrest, but Gregory protected her. The mission had no immediate result, but when word reached him that unless he came soon, Rome would join the revolt, Gregory, perhaps moved also by Catherine's pleas, set out from Marseille and reached Rome on January 17, 1377. He was not unanimously welcomed. The appeal of Florence had stirred old republican memories in the degenerate city, and Gregory was warned that his life was unsafe in the ancient capital of Christendom. In May, he retired to Anagni. And now, as if at last yielding to Catherine, he turned from war to diplomacy. His agents encouraged the populace of the cities, who longed for peace with the church, to overthrow their rebel governments, and to all towns that returned to his allegiance he promised self-government and under a papal vicar of their own choice. City after city accepted these terms. In 1377, Florence agreed with Gregory to let Bernabo Visconti arbitrate their dispute. Bernabo, having persuaded the Pope to give him half of any penalty he might lay upon Florence, bade the city pay an indemnity of 800,000 florins, or $20 million, to the Holy See. Deserted by her allies, Florence angrily submitted, but Pope Urban VI reduced the penalty to 250,000 florins. Gregory had not lived to see his victory. On November 7, 1377, he returned to Rome. He had been an invalid even in Avignon and had not borne well his winter in central Italy. He felt the approach of death and feared that the conflict between France and Italy for possession of the papacy would tear the church to pieces. On March 19, 1378, he made arrangements for the speedy election of his successor. Eight days later, he died, longing for Le Beau Pays de France. 3. The Christian Life, 1300 to 1424. Deferring to a later chapter, a consideration of the faith of the people and the morals of the clergy, let us note two contrasting features of Christian life in 14th century Italy the Inquisition and the saints. This book is continued on cassette three, side one.